Good afternoon. On behalf of the Downtown Spokane Partnership staff and on behalf of our boards, I want to welcome you to the 2019 Downtown Spokane Partnership Annual Meeting. Thank you so much for being here. What a great crowd. Let's start by giving yourselves a hand. Uh, thank you so much for being here. So for those of the, you that aren't aware of what our mission is, I know we have some newcomers here, which I'm really personally excited to have you here to just check out this organization. I thought I'd share with you and start with our mission. And, and that is, uh, our mission is to create a dynamic, uh, safe, vital, vibrant, and sustainable downtown um, as the basis for an economically healthy region. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, as you can tell just by that mission statement, that's an immense task. It's an immense load that our team has on our shoulders. Uh, and uh, they do a phenomenal job, but we couldn't do it without many of you and without our stakeholders and partners. Um, as is in, indicated in the name, uh, much of our success and our function really is in our ability to bring people together, um, seeding ideas, convening public and private community stakeholders, and collectively developing or supporting initiatives to accomplish great things. Um, throughout today's program, as you feel inspired, uh, hopefully you will, uh, we invite you to doodle your ideas about what you might like to see in the future of your city and your downtown on the black paper that's in front of you. We also encourage you to consider uh, tagging us through social media uh, with the hashtag reimagine uh, at Downtown Spokane, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, let folks know that you're here and let them know what you're excited about um, about your downtown today and in the future. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. So at this time, I'd like to recognize and extend our special thanks uh, to those partners who've made our work and this event possible. And as is the case every meeting, every annual meeting, we always start with our closest partner and that is our, um, our partners at the City of Spokane. And I know we have several of you here today. Uh, 2019 marks the 24th year that this organization has been in existence. And that is through a contract um, issued by the city and the city council in particular for us to represent and to manage the business improvement district on behalf of the businesses in the downtown area. Uh, we are so excited and proud each and every day by the renaissance that has occurred in downtown. If you think about it, what's happened over the last uh, quarter century and we're immensely grateful uh, to embark together with our city partners uh, this year to update our downtown plan, uh, working with all of you to truly reimagine what is possible in our downtown. So we wanna make sure that we recognize, and I know we have some uh, city staff, and I'm not sure who all is here, but let me start with, I know that Mayor Condon had RSVP'd. Uh, we have, if I uh, maybe could have you uh, stand, if you're here, Mayor, Councilwoman Lori Kinnear, Councilmember Brian Biggs, I know, had RSVP'd. Um, so as our elected officials from the city of Spokane, if we could please give them a warm thank you for allowing us to exist. Oh. Councilman Fagan, I know you were on the cusp. Are you here? Uh, you had texted me late. There you are. Thank you, Mike, for everything you do for us. So uh, the council uh, allows us to exist through that contract, but it's the work that gets done day to day is really in the trenches with your team. Uh, and so I know that we have Carly Court right here, we have Marlene Feist, uh, but uh, at the risk of missing anybody, I'd ask our city employees, John Moog, uh, please stand and let us thank you for your partnership and work with us each and every day. Uh, we also have um, uh, not only a board member of ours, a dear friend of mine, a colleague, a former, a former seatmate, and uh, one, again, one of our board members who representing us from the region, and that is County Commissioner Al French. Al, would you please stand and be recognized? As you can imagine, many organizations stepped up to uh, make this meeting possible and for, to allow us to share with you our agenda for the next coming year. We want to thank our major sponsors, Coles Company and Witherspoon Kelly, our partner sponsors, Avista and NAC Architecture, and to our contributing sponsors shown on the screen behind me, uh, who are all integral, again, to our success. Um, so please give them a warm thank you.
In front of you, you have the first glimpse at our annual magazine. This is probably still warm. It's hot off the press. And uh, that the, the partnership that we have in producing our annual magazine is with the Journal of Business. Paul Reed, I know you're here. Um, if you or your team, I know if you have other team uh, members in the audience, we want to extend our thank you for helping us to produce what we think is a top-tier magazine each and every year. Uh, this year, it has a little bit of a twist uh, to it in terms of the perspective that you're going to read about uh, not only our downtown, but what folks imagine and or reimagine about what downtown could be. And so I want to thank our Journal of Business partners. We hope that you uh, get a chance to read this. We have uh, Paul is gracious enough and his team to uh, provide as a part of our partnership several copies of this magazine. And so we want to make sure that you as businesses have copies of this magazine sitting on your coffee table in your lobby so that uh, your customers can pick one up, take it with them, and again, find out more about this downtown thing and how they can get involved. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from our guest speaker, uh, Kate Jonkus. Kate's attendance today was made possible by the support of our presenting sponsor, STCU. At this time, I'd like to invo invite our STCU president and CEO, Ezra Eckhart, to the podium to share a few words with you about STCU. Ezra? Thanks, Mark. Um, I was going to try to make some joke about the snow, but it's just not funny anymore. So <laughs> we'll let that go. Um, but I was looking at the magazine uh, before I came up here, and then I see this nice banner that's highlighting uh, STCU has been around for 85 years. And a few little tidbits, um, but some that are nicely highlighted on here. We have two branches that are in the downtown Spokane area, um, conveniently just out of either side of the picture <laughs> that's on here. Um, but there's two downtown, trust me. And, and then I was thinking about this and in, in going back to the 85 years that we've been around. And uh, STCU, for those of you who don't know, actually started in the Lewis and Clark High School, which is on this picture. So we did, we did actually make it there. And, and 85 years ago, um, as we originally started, it was with a shoebox that was lowered out of a window uh, by a gentleman named Ernie McElvain. And we started with $8,000 that were collected up from the teachers at that school. There was a little bell that sat down on the stoop. And as teachers or other uh, teachers from around the community would want to make a deposit, they'd come up and they'd ring the bell. And Ernie would lower the shoebox back down to them. They'd put their money inside and then he'd raise it back up. And it wasn't until 1960 that we actually opened up a real branch just up off of division. And if you think about that compared to today, we are just about to open up our 23rd branch. Um, at the end of the year, we were the second largest credit union in the state of Washington behind BECU, and it's not even close. They're almost seven times bigger than we are. So we're really the largest operational uh, credit union in the state of Washington. We will cross over 200,000 members um, in the year 2019, and almost all of those members are in Spokane County and Kootenai County. So if you think about the city of Spokane, roughly half of the, the residents of the city of Spokane are STCU members, and about a third of the people in Spokane County are STCU members. So for us, we're here for good. This is our community. Um, we absolutely love downtown Spokane. We love Spokane as a community and, and for all of the value that we can pull together um, as a much larger community to make this a better place. So we're happy to be here today and to support DSP in their annual event, but because we want to be here tomorrow and we want to be here for the next 85 years. And part of what we're working on as a, a leadership team planning at STCU is how we bridge into the second century of our organization. And we couldn't think of a better place to do that than Spokane. So we're happy to be here and, and thanks for having us. Thank you, Ezra. Uh, apparently, for uh, just a, an additional shoebox full of money, we would have gotten your branch on the picture in the magazine. <laughs> I apologize for that. That was not intentional. Uh, thank you, Ezra, for personally, just as a friend, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your leadership at STCU, and thank you for STCU, your engagement in our community and everything you do. And, uh, and then again, I extend another thanks to all of our uh, sponsors for today's meeting.
So about an hour ago, we, uh, we shifted course a couple of years ago. We decided to hold a separate business meeting so that we could save you the pain of going through all of our annual elections. And so about an hour ago, your, your boards, our Downtown Spokane Partnership Board and the, and the Business Improvement Board, uh, members and ratepayers met uh, in order to elect our leadership for 2019. So now to share the outcomes of those elections uh, of that meeting and then also a brief recap of the last year's work, I want to uh, start by asking you to join me in welcoming 2018's Chair of the Business Improvement Ratepayer District, Mr. Thomas Hicks. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to take a minute and we'll just highlight some of the accomplishments that our, that our board had uh, for 2018. In 2018, Mark and I had an opportunity to work with a number of the parking lot owners around town uh, to try to improve the quality of lighting uh, that uh, the, the lots had and then getting them to convert over to the LED. This is, uh, was supported by the green team and the ambassadors that helped us go around in the evening time to see where the light wasn't uh, of the quality that we would like to have. Also during uh, 2018, we welcomed, uh, excuse me, we uh, worked with the city council uh, to be able to put together a downtown security camera program. Hopefully during uh, 2019, this effort will uh, commence and we'll begin to see cameras throughout the downtown. In 2018, we welcomed 73 new businesses to downtown including six new restaurants, a couple breweries, five coffee shops, and five tech companies. We revamped, we revamped our assessment methodology to better serve the ratepayers and to welcome a new section of the, of the downtown, the Northwest downtown section to the bid. In October, two ambassadors attended uh, certification classes in crime prevention through the uh, in, uh, environmental design company to help businesses and property owners take control of their properties by designing space that positively influences human behavior. We achieved a goal of contacting every rate payer in downtown to be, uh, to be through a visit by the ambassadors, the clean team, or the staff we continued efforts to provide events to enhance the downtown experience. In December, we partnered with the Davenport Grand Hotel to premiere the return um, of the window displays from the Crescent Department Store, not seen since 1998. In addition to encouraging the tradition of the holiday window decorations with the display contest sponsored by the uh, Spokesman Review. Together with uh, uh, River Park Square, we, um, we uh, spearheaded downtown's first fall festival, giving away nearly 400 pumpkins in a two hour period. I would like to personally thank the staff of the, the partnership that helped uh, in my efforts for my year, Mark, uh, Maria, uh, Andrew, Michelle, Kelly, the ambassadors, and of course the green team. Um, to the ratepayers representatives um, who provide uh, invaluable um, feedback on the status of the downtown, thank you for serving along with me during this last year. Now I'd like to acknowledge those members who uh, will be retiring from the bid board. If you please stand when I call your name, uh, uh, if you can. Retiring from the bid board is Bailey Naley. She's in a residential. Josh Hisong is in our residential. Mark Daly is in zone 3A. And Tana Adams, a professional accounting. New members on the board uh, coming in this year is Jeremy Newcomb, Pia Christensen, Jack Johnson, and Jamin Allen. I'd like to add uh, uh, the rest of the board members, if they could, uh, 
and thank them for another year uh, that's a work ahead of them. And so uh, please stand if you can and, and uh, receive your acknowledgement. Okay, with that, I'd like to turn this meeting now over to our uh, uh, downtown uh, uh, pre president, uh, Corey Barbieri. Thank you, Thomas. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Corey Barbieri, your 2018 DSP chair. And Ezra, uh, thank you to STCU for your sponsorship. I do challenge you and agree with you that I'm sick of the snow, but I do, maybe STCU can put together a bounty of money so we can go catch that groundhog that <laughs> lied to all of us. Um, I wanna start by saying thank you to Mr. Tom Hicks. He did a fantastic job as the bid president and displayed a, a, a great courage throughout the year with a lot of challenges. As we begin 2018, and I talked to, talking to the board, one of the most important things that I wanted to lead on was advocacy and being a leader as a downtown Spokane partnership on advocacy issues. When you think of advocacy and issues that come up in a city, so often, you know, I kind of analogy it like a ping pong, you throw down a gravel road. You just never know where that ball's gonna bounce. And so one day we might be talking about homelessness, which is a very, very serious item to panhandling to whatever else items that might come up. So I think our team did an incredible job with advocacy throughout the 2019 year. With those achievements, I wanted to go over them in detail, a few of them in priority. We gained historic preservation codes. We fought to retain the quality of life laws to keep downtown safe and inviting, particularly in the sit and lie ordinance. We led an engagement process to ensure businesses and property interests were reflected in the upcoming Riverside Avenue redevelopment project. We hosted our first downtown dialogue series, engaging over 120 business owners, service providers, and municipal leaders throughout the community, which was a very emotionally charged conversation. Um, it was viewed by over 10,000 people on YouTube, social media, and really continue the dialogue on how we can make a difference in downtown Spokane. These dialogue meetings will continue in 2019 and encourage each and every one of you to, to attend them to make Spokane a better place. Another important DSP priority um, that was started several years ago was try to get the parking dollars to remain downtown. With that, some of those uh, came to fruition this year with the planting of 20 new beautiful trees in downtown Spokane. 54 new curbside planter boxes, 30 pull-mounted holiday lights and Christmas decorations, and over half a million dollars that you'll soon be, see being spent in the Maple Jefferson off-ramp gateway improvement project later this year. Um, furthermore, the advocacy efforts focused on raising the height limits on Spokane Falls Boulevard for taller buildings. There's a lot more to come on that in 2019, and thanks to our uh, city leaders and neighborhood communities, it looks like that's moving in the right direction. All of this would not be possible without the support of an engaged board of directors listed here. This year, five individuals be retiring from the DSP board. Please stand as I call your name if you are in attendance. Tom Hicks, we know you're here. Leticia Hill. University District Chair, Brady Cass, Assurus Northwest, Ann Martin, Heilman Martner, Architects, Sharon Fairchild, Providence Healthcare. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you, thank you. I would also like to take a moment and thank my wonderful team at Goodale and Barbieri, uh, my wife Brianna, and my kids for allowing me to serve this last year. It's been very rewarding and I'm looking forward to having some of the Wednesday evenings back in my life in 2019. With that, I'd lastly like to tell um, Mr. Mike Curran, who's gonna be your 2019 chair. Um, that'll be your sounding board in the year ahead. I look forward to making an impact to continue to grow and thrive downtown Spokane. You're gonna do an amazing job as the 2019 chair. 
With that said, I'm fairly certain, I think I'm gonna sleep like a golden retriever tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, it takes a community to really make a difference in all of you in the room, so thank you. Uh, I think that makes a few of us that are gonna sleep well tonight. Uh, thank you, Corey, thank you, Tom, for that presentation. Uh, if, uh, I know if several of you have been on the receiving end of one of my membership calls, and uh, there's one thing that I like to say about our organization that maybe gives you a little glimpse if you're new to our organization, is that uh, we believe Downtown Spokane Partnership is the only organization that really focuses day in, day out on what I call the care and the feeding of your beautiful downtown. Uh, we are constantly thinking ahead and trying to envision what we see our city becoming. Both of these boards, as you've heard some of the names mentioned, you could tell that they're incredibly active, they're incredibly busy, community partners, um, but they are committed to this and to creating a better community for the future, and it's incredibly rewarding work. Um, and so we've recognized them today, uh, but we also feel like it's just as important to take a moment for all of us to recognize those who have invested into, into this future, who have changed downtown's trajectory, so to speak. Uh, that is why in 2015 we uh, created a, um, we committed, organ excuse me, for, for our 20th anniversary, the DSP, uh, of the DSP, we committed to recognizing individuals and organizations uh, that have contributed to the revitalization of our urban core uh, through the implementation of a new legacy award. And then the following year, uh, we added what we call the impact award, and that is to recognize more present day uh, leadership and investment so that we are not forgetting folks that are moving the needle today. Uh, recipients were nominated, recipients for these awards are nominated by the community. Uh, they're then narrowed down by the joint exec committees for both of those boards and approved by both of the governing organizations. Each award comes with a beautiful trophy, but hopefully more importantly to the recipients today, it comes with our profound respect and gratitude uh, from our boards, from this staff, and I think you're gonna agree uh, from all of you. We all understand that great things are not accomplished overnight and they certainly don't happen by accident. Any good plan, um, like the one for a vibrant downtown, requires doers, people or entities that do the hard work, that execute on those inspired ideas and persist in spite of all odds. And um, again, I think these recipients this year will certainly epitomize those traits. So to present this year's awards, I'd like to invite back up to the stage our 2018 board chair, Tom Hicks, and Corey Barbieri to hand out those awards. Tom? All right, it's truly an honor to be able to, uh, I'm gonna do the Impact Award this year. The Impact Award is awarded uh, to a company, organization, or individual who made an impact on, in, on the downtown core in recent years, um, recipient of, uh, of, uh, of uh, renegades and risk takers often find potential in the underutilizing properties or leading um, credi um, credible or out outrageous ideas. Recipients uh, look at the community as a whole, bring together partners to re revolutionize the way businesses are done and serve as a role model for others. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, Spokane was bustling rail and a mining hub, a place for entrepreneurs to come west and stake their claim. Along the banks of the river, a powerful gorge uh, infant metropolis grew and the leaders of industry began to conduct legacies reflected of their ideas, wealth, and prosperity. Among those legacies uh, was erected a, a, a center of entertainment, the Davenport Hotel, where the dignitaries, celebrities, and locals met for festivals, celebrations, and special uh, occasions. A showcase for a, a cultural center, but by mid-century the boom had uh, quieted, followed by sprawl, 
retail and leisure fled to, to the urban cores and for the suburbs and then commerce was lured west uh, to the port cities. Spokane, a great, um, greatest, a great buildings became a sort of stale. The hotel has hosted Elvis Presley, Babe Ruth, and the, Ken and the Kennedys, and then closed its doors in 1985. The Donning Project uh, of returning the once great hotel to the original state was almost too overwhelming uh, to be possible. But without the vision and uh, determination of the worthies, it's, it's hard to imagine what downtown would look like today had the historic heartbeat of, the, of Spokane had not been revitalized. In 2002, following two years of restoration, the gorgeous personal investment, excuse me, in a generous personal investment, the historical uh, um, Davenport Hotel op reopened carefully and returned to its original cluster. Following the downtown, uh, through the downtown, uh, through the Davenport collection, the Worthies have continued to invest in the downtown core, building, the, of course, the Davenport uh, Tower, the Grand Hotel, and of course now investing in the centennial that we're, we're sitting in today. Without the initial impact uh, of re uh, revitalizing the downtown hotel, it's hard to imagine what downtown would uh, uh, look like. Would the, the Fox Theater now be a parking lot? Would there be a expansion center, a convention center? Would the groundbreaking on the, the state of the new uh, superplex be happening? Would Spokane uh, be a destination for national tenants like Skate America and the NCAA basketball? I want to thank uh, you, uh, Walt and Karen Worthy, for bringing back a little bit of Spokane. We had the, the opportunity to reintroduce the Davenport and recreate that service that the hotel was known for so many years ago. And it honestly took someone like Walt and Karen to do it. Everything they did, you know, whether it was designing the guest rooms or um, adding certain features, was focused on the guests. I feel very fortunate that we have owners that invest in the properties to give us all the tools to maintain these, these buildings in a very professional and proper way. And then really our focus is to just take care of the guests. I think that was you know, a second step in downtown that really catapulted uh, all of our confidence, the community's confidence in restoring downtown. You know, I think a lot of our growth has been um, first from the success of the historic hotel. You know, things worked and worked really well and Walt and Karen would say they enjoy the business. It's a fun business. Every day is different. The tower came about because we needed more guest rooms to associate with the meeting room space that we had at the historic. The other properties and the other growth really came from trying to create something new for Spokane. When we were thinking about building the Grand Hotel, he actually at some point found a piece of carpet that he loved. And we really kind of designed the hotel around the carpet that he found. When we were building the Grand Hotel, uh, the construction crews were there all day and they would leave in the afternoon and I would go down and see the progress. And all of a sudden I hear a little noise in the lobby and I walk. Uh, through the lobby and here's Walt with his bare hands um, pasting drywall mud or mud onto the wall and sticking stone on it and I asked Walt what, what he was doing and he said well the construction crews all left but they left a bucket of mud and I didn't want it to go to waste so he was hand tiling uh, the fireplace. You know, his personality is just dive in and figure it out and don't look back and failure is not an option. Uh, honest, eager and drive. You know, drive to deliver a great product and great service. I'm sure as Walt and Karen are uh, basking in the sun of Florida right now, accordingly, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Lynette Cuddle, Cuddle uh, uh, the uh, marketing uh, director of the uh, Davenport Hotel Collection, to come up and accept this award for Walt.
Hmm? You're not her. I'm not Linnell, but you're, I do. you're not her, baby. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's get a picture of it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Next up to present our Legacy Award is Corey Barbieri. Thank you, Mark. Legacy Award. The Legacy Award is awarded to a company, organization, or individual who has left a mark on the city by creating positive and sustainable transformation in downtown over a long period of time. Recipients represent visionary and creative problem-solving solutions accomplished through grassroots efforts, strong partnerships, and innovation. Recipients exemplify exceptional contributions to the business, civic, human vitality of downtown Spokane, often becoming the catalyst of other development in the community. Spokane is a city of superlatives, a city that takes pride on the ability to implement unique and often unfathomable ideas. One of these ideas came from Seattle Transplant, an Olympic athlete, teacher, author, and shoe slinger, ranks solidly among the top five largest timed road races in the United States. The super, super, superlative is Bloomsday, excuse me. What started as a fun run to capitalize on the reunification of downtown Spokane was Expo 74, is now part of the DNA that is the city of Spokane. From a little more than 1,000 participants in the inaugural 1997 race to a peak of over 61,000, in 1996. There are few Spokane citizens who haven't participated in Bloomsday as a runner, jogger, walker, volunteer, supporter, booster, a band member, or a costume vulture. Bloomsday is the kickoff to spring, a reminder to pack up your snow boots, put away your snow shovel, and slip on your sneakers. Bloomsday is the reason Spokane is a city on the move, a city where you can join a runner's club for every night of the week. Bloomsday is the connection you have on Monday after the race and the coffee line, where all the customers are wearing the same t-shirt. Bloomsday's legacy is being the first, but not the last, reason to kick, out of your, kick the cars out of downtown Spokane and fill the streets with people on an amazing scale. 42 years after crossing the finish line on the Monroe Street Bridge, its founder, retiring from his official position as race director, but forever will be a legacy behind the race. Thank you, Don, for giving Spokane a reason to come downtown, to come downtown again, again, and again. Roll the video, please. It's what makes Spokane so special for a runner that you have 50, 60,000 people that do a race in the spring and running takes over this town. For the longest time, too, it, it, the, the conventional wisdom may have been, you're going to what? You're going to close off the downtown corridor, you're going to close the city streets, which really, outside of the Boston Marathon or outside of the New York City Marathon was, was unheard of. What's that going to mean for, for merchants? What's that going to be for businesses? But of course, the economic impact of it all has just been staggering. Bloomsday helped create a downtown corridor venue experience that hadn't been seen before, certainly in Spokane, if not up and down the West Coast. Don Cardong's favorite phrase is to say, it was incomprehensible to think that something like this would happen. But of course, as we look back on it now, it's incomprehensible to think of Spokane in the springtime without Bloomsday. Don Cardong is one of the most modest individuals that you will that you will ever know. Acclaimed writer and author, world famous distance runner, Spokane celebrity, Olympian. You know, part of the golden age of distance runners uh, in American history. You know, he's approachable by everyone. Without that type of personality and without that type of, of celebrity, a very approachable celebrity, Bloomsday wouldn't be what it is today. And we have Don Cardong to thank for that. 
Please welcome Don Cardon. Don't worry, I won't be long. Uh, when I saw 2,000 runners in the Peachtree Road Race in Atlanta back in 1976, I was stunned. So many runners running down the street. I thought, we could do this in Spokane. And Expo had totally transformed our downtown. We had a new park right next to it. The setting was perfect. I thought maybe one day we might be as big as Peachtree with 2,000 runners. But instead, Bloomsday numbers went through the roof, growing by about 5,000 per year for 10 years. We caught the wave of the first running boom perfectly, and we had the perfect setting here in Spokane. But the reason we were able to grow and manage the growth was because of overwhelming community support. Whenever we had a problem, we had our volunteers figured out how to fix it. And we continue to rely on those volunteers, 5,000 of them, every year to keep this party going. We also rely on the support of the downtown business community. The support is appreciated by the 40 to 50,000 Bloomies who run through the streets each year. And we hope that those thousands of participants, many of whom are new to downtown, appreciate what a great place it is and come back to shop, to dine, to be entertained. The legacy is, that is Bloomsday is the result of a community working together, and in accepting this award, I do so in appreciation of the way so many people, so many organizations have worked together to make it happen. Thank you, Downtown Spokane, for this award. Thank you. What an inspiration, right? Um, uh, thank you and congratulations to Walt and Kara and congratulations to you, Don. Thank you uh, for your daughter being here today to support you. Um, uh, very kind of you to be here. So we are, we are very, very fortunate to have incredible leaders like this in our own community. Um, so just I want to share a few, few words with you to kind of set the stage for our, uh, our speaker and then also share uh, with you really what our most important task is for this year and that's working on our downtown plan and, and in hopefully encouraging and inciting all of you to consider engaging in that. Uh, so a favorite quote of mine I use around the office that my team gets I think probably sick of is if you fail to plan, you plan to fail by Ben Franklin. You probably all have heard it. Um, I share it with them not only to try to inspire them and to encourage them to plan, but also because I need reminding sometimes uh, of the importance of planning in a time when oftentimes it's that doing, the rolling up your sleeves, the accomplishing of a task that really is more um, rewarding, right? Um, we find ourselves in that exact situation today as we're embarking on a pretty daunting task, and that's the update of our downtown plan with our city partners. Uh, to be honest, um, I have to admit, it, it really isn't, doesn't feel all that exciting when you first think about it uh, and or rewarding uh, when, if you're like me, like I said, is that you really find the energy and the buzz out of, out of doing. Um, the risk of, uh, I think, the, 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 what we're facing, though, is that without a, a comprehensive and a visionary plan, we run the risk of losing our way. We run the risk of getting caught in the weeds. Um, we run the risk of not accomplishing those great things because we never set out, we never even imagined we could accomplish them. Um, so history tells us, as Ben Franklin said, uh, without a visionary roadmap for the future, uh, the city of Spokane, our city center downtown, will be at the risk of um, complacency. Um, that we aren't able to identify the challenges that are in front of us or that might not even be contemplated by getting together and, and um, challenging ourselves to think. We've learned a lot in the last 10 years since our plan was last updated uh, that can help us, I think, refine how we best uh, focus to accomplish what we still find important 
but also probably just as importantly, what we need to take off of that plan uh, that are perhaps or modify those things that are no longer relevant. If you just think about the technology advancements and how our priorities have changed over just the last 10 years, um, the average person to the average person, uh, maybe some uh, you know uh, tech geeks or engineers might have thought of that. This I certainly didn't. Autonomous cars were something that we saw on television and were only dreamed up and fantasized in Hollywood. Um, our need, and this is really important, I think you saw some of the things that we talked about in terms of activation, this is a real key component of what we do, is, in, is creating and fostering and supporting different events, whether it's Bloomsday, Hoop Fest, Lilac Festival, or our own events. Um, th but that need for um, uh, spaces and experience that can bring around that, ab about that human interaction that forges those lifelong memories, uh, really had yet to really emerge as an alternative to the practicality of saving through our online shopping, right? Uh, but we also discovered that that human interaction, guess what, is pretty critical to our own well-being. And so we, we've come back around to that. We really weren't thinking of that 10 years ago. Um, let's face it, commitment to things like, uh, you think about this, greater personal happiness, um, a meaning-fulfilled life, a uh, more flexible lifestyle over a traditional career, was kind of seen as a pipe dream, right? Or uh, idealistic, and certainly not a generation that we should be designing and planning for, but yet here we are. Um, if we are wise, and I see a lot of wise people out here, um, the changing landscape leads us to ask some important questions. How should our transportation, how should our workplace, what should our housing look like, what should the urban experience evolve to, to accommodate today's reality that we didn't think about 10 years ago, and what do we know about the future reality that we need to be planning for today? Um, so we decided to ask. Uh, we went out on the street a couple weeks ago, and uh, here's a little bit of the feedback we heard. I moved here in 2011. Uh, we never really went downtown that much, but we actually come downtown a lot here just because it's a lot more fun. I've lived here for almost 10 years, and so it's been fun to see. You can actually see the changes happening. So normally we come to play at Mobius. The ice ribbon and the gondola ride. I like going to Mobius. We have season passes. I like to go ice skating. Well, we love going to Adorities. We, yeah. we love Adorities. We used to. There was one up north. That's kind yeah. of our main drive. We'll head all over for breweries. I like hanging out with her. She's my best friend. Yeah. I like going on around Spokane in general with my friends. We are at a birthday party for Eloin's friends at the carousel. Is it so fun? Yes. We're looking at planning like 10 to 20 years out. 20 years? Wow. <laughs> you go up there, there's probably going to be some robot over there doing all your tickets and stuff like that. I could see something like that. So by then we should have hoverboards. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out what do we want to add to our downtown. H&M, that would be yes. <laughs> we got to bring back the little wine bikes. They were fun. My middle child is very, very active and she needs something a little bit more climbing, playing, running, jumping. <laughs> so that would be something awesome to have down here. Maybe it would be good to have a place <laughs> yeah. for little kids, little kids to kids. play. And... Giving us something to do during the winter. Uh, anything that's family uh, orientation really makes a difference in, in what you do. More things like the ice ribbon. Smile for the camera. I would love easy drop off where like if another parent is driving, we can tumble out of the car without fear for our lives of the other cars being mad. So like if the mall had like a little turnout, because sometimes we do that, like if we're running late for something or like at Mobius and the parking's kind of tough, I'd love to drop them off with, you know, their dad and then go find parking. Basically the hardest thing we have, we found is when we do come down, and usually it's a lot of times missed timing on peak hours, so trying to find parking. Is One of the most fun things is when they do the outdoor movie. Um, so, I don't know, I guess I'd like to see more events kind of like that happening, like events that are in the park with food trucks. Anything like wild that, I don't know, if maybe it's, we've been talking about a zip line over the river. Is there something that you're like, I don't know if that's possible. That would be awesome. The other schools do roller rinks, and I never go because it's so far up north and there's a ton of lights between us and north. And so 
a roller rink would be awesome. You just think of my son, he loves cars. So like a like a racetrack, like go-kart, maybe. I want Spokane to know in general that Spokane's lit, especially downtown. Downtown Spokane is lit. <laughs> Woo. Isn't that fun? So in 2019, we're going to embark and we're going to continue to ask kids of all ages to, re to reimagine downtown. Uh, the Downtown Spokane Partnership, in partnership with our closest partner, the City of Spokane, recently released an RFP uh, for help as we engage with you and many others to update our plan. Throughout the year, uh, we'll be engaged in a lot of opportunity for input uh, to put together a plan that can guide and inspire us to create uh, downtown that best reflects the values and the demands of our community, uh, both today and for future generations, as best we know it in this very moment. Please join me in welcoming our incoming board chair, Erica Mostet, and DSP board chair, incoming board chair, Mike Curran to the podium to share a few more highlights of our plans for 2019 for our bid and DSP board. Erica. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mark. It's a real honor for me to have the opportunity to serve as the bid board chair for 2019. Uh, I look forward to working with you, the staff of the DSP, and all of the fellow board members as we look forward to a fabulous year. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my colleagues and our CEO, Susan Horton from Wheatland Bank, for allowing me the time and the flexibility in my schedule to be able to serve in this role. Um, and then as we look forward to the coming year, I'd like to highlight just a few of the key strategic initiatives that we will be focusing on throughout 2019. Uh, we will continue to partner with the city to begin the implementation of the study outcomes to address some of the issues that were mentioned in the video with regards to parking and some of the limitations that we have downtown. Uh, we will continue to engage our members and our ratepayers at a higher level with the help of our new business relations manager, Kelly Blythe. Welcome, Kelly, to the team. Continuing advancement of a holistic strategy for reducing homelessness and the vagrancy by connecting the most vulnerable on our streets with services, providing hope and opportunity for those uh, who need a hand up and also holding accountable those who uh, would like to continue to be a nuisance or commit crimes on our, on our, within our community. Uh, we will continue to support the downtown police precinct and ensure that they have the legal tools needed to keep downtown welcoming and inviting and protect the region's commercial and cultural hub. And we will continue to engage with city administration and council in alleyway improvements to bring activity and opportunity to come, uh, to come of downtown's most underutilized streets. Um, so those are some of the highlights that we will be touching on throughout 2019. We look forward to hearing from our ratepayers um, for additional ideas or things that we can do to help tackle those issues. Uh, and with that, I would like to welcome Mike Curran, the 2019 DSP board chair. What she said. Thank you. My copy of the agenda says that my comments are to be brief, but uh, giving a microphone and a podium to a lawyer is probably not the way to assure that. Uh, for all our sake, though, I'll, uh, I'll try to do my best. I'd like to thank, start by thanking, uh, joining Mark in thanking our event sponsors. Uh, without the generosity and commitment uh, of these uh, uh, companies and groups to our downtown, meetings like this just would be really hard to pull off. I'd also like to join Mark in thanking the uh, Davenport Hotel uh, Collection for their continued commitment to an investment in downtown Spokane as shown by uh, this Centennial Hotel. I don't know if any of you walked through the lobby, but the rest of the hotel is gonna be redone just like that, and it's gonna be fantastic. We thank them for that and for the jobs that are remaining in our community and that are going to be added to our community because of their efforts and investment. Mark is way too modest to shine the spotlight on himself, so I'd like to take a minute to thank him and his team for their commitment and creativity and efforts on behalf of downtown, and also to our uh, clean team and uh, ambassadors who go out uh, really every day and, and uh, clean up our streets and make our downtown a safe and uh, vibrant place for us to live, work, and play, and for our friends to visit. 
And then, uh, as Mark, I'd like to thank our city government, both our uh, elected officials and, uh, and our city staff, uh, for their efforts, and also our, our uh, Spokane Police Department for everything that they do to make uh, people feel welcome and safe uh, downtown. And, and then also our uh, boards, uh, as uh, Tom and Corey have indicated, the boards of both the BID and the uh, DSP are entirely volunteer driven. And uh, each member of the board has uh, given generously both of their time and their treasure to make sure that uh, Spokane is, a, is and remains and continues to be a great place to uh, do business. And then finally, in the thanking department anyways, I want to thank uh, my colleagues at Witherspoon Kelly who have generously supported me and the Downtown Sp Spokane Partnership uh, for many, many years. And with all deference to uh, uh, Ezra, STCU is just a new kid on the block. There's been somebody at Witherspoon Kelly coming into work in Downtown Spokane every day since 1884. <laughs> so. So we were well into middle age by the time uh, that shoebox, <laughs> yeah, well so was STCU I think. Um, anyways, uh, as, as Mark has said, the success of downtown depends really on everybody who uh, works and lives and works and, and plays and recreates down here to, you know, open up their checkbooks, roll up their sleeves. And, and, and when a call uh, for action or a request for help is made to, uh, to respond and to help out. Downtowns don't make themselves great. They don't improve themselves great. It takes committed, active, and engaged people to do it. Looking ahead uh, briefly to 2019, um, we are going to have a challenging and busy year. Uh, and we welcome the input of each of you uh, and your help as we, uh, as we work through the uh, issues that uh, we all face as downtown businesses. We are first and foremost, as uh, Mark indicated, an advocacy group. We advocate for the interests of downtown. Among the initiatives that we're gonna work on in the coming year uh, are some of our old initiatives. We are going to work hard to bring new businesses into our downtown. And to our community as a whole, we are going to work hard to improve the environment for our existing businesses and their customers. And as you've seen, we're going to be taking a leadership role in uh, the update to the downtown plan. It's an opportunity really for all of us to envision what we want our city to be and what it can be and what it should be in the coming 10 years and for the 10 years after that. Like most cities, uh, not only in our region, but in our nation, we struggle with a crisis in homelessness. We will continue uh, as an organization to engage with service providers, with city leaders, law enforcement, property owners, and also with homeless advocates. Uh, and we'll actively participate in the uh, Hope's Works program, the mayor's uh, continuum of care board, and the regional homelessness plans. But in this regard, we are and we will continue to be staunch advocates for the continuation of the sit and lie ordinance, which has, uh, I think, really helped improve the uh, uh, business and just general uh, 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 environment downtown. Our advocacy work will also uh, involve other areas, including uh, working with our state legislature to provide tax uh, incentives and initiatives uh, to promote downtown infill development. We'll uh, address, as uh, Erica was indicating, the downtown parking issues, which are a challenge to all of us. We'll work on easing the height restrictions on the uh, uh, development along Spokane Falls Boulevards. And all of this is to encourage downtown business uh, development and investment. And as a final thought, uh, I'd just like to say our, our downtown and our city as a whole are dynamic and they are always changing and our efforts uh, can ne really never end. Um, while every now and again we can you know, get together like this and give ourselves a good pat on the back for a job well done, we have to end that with for now because the reality is, is our job is never done. Uh, there's always going to be something to do. 
I've been working downtown really for more years than I can count on all my, my fingers and toes. And from my experience, downtown is as good and, or better than it's ever been. And I think with all of our help and engagement, it can be uh, better still. So thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Mike. We're in great hands. Uh, so that, those are some things that our boards have come together on in terms of what our priorities are. But what's missing is all of your input and your engagement to the extent that you have time. Um, uh, here today, and really why probably you're here most, is to hear from our keynote speaker. Um, to say that our keynote speaker has extensive experience in economic development revitalization, uh, guiding downtowns through periods of major growth is a gross understatement. For 20 years, Ms. Kate Jonkus served as the CEO of the Downtown Seattle Association, guiding one of the most successful revitalization projects in the country. Creating a vibrant downtown Seattle with robust retail, transportation, and jobs, thousands of residents, and a growing diverse economy. Prior to that, she assisted dozens of communities through the design and implementation of successful downtown revitalization strategies at the, at the National Main Street Center and at the Oregon Downtown uh, Development Association. Then, as Seattle's deputy mayor from 2014 to 2017, uh, Kate managed the city operations, led complex intergovernmental projects, including uh, major waterfront developments and convention center expansion, and developed a nationally recognized government performance initiative. To a proven expert in the fields of strategic planning, downtown development, and public and private partnership strategies, Jonkus brings her expertise to clients who need to solve complicated, complex urban development challenges. Uh, and so she is here to inspire us today. We're very fortunate and grateful to have you with us, Kate. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Kate Jonkus. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you to our sponsor. I'm a proud credit union member of WSCCU for a long time. So thank you very much for your support today. So it is really actually a good time for downtown these days. And it is especially a good time to be downtown for you. Because you know, just looking at the kind of things you're seeing about Spokane in the news, you are now in the cool kids club of cities. And um, it's great that you have this theme today of reimagine Spokane because you are being reimagined by people all over the country. A famous think tank, the Brookings Institute, um, called your higher education cluster and your new McKinstry Innovation Center the key to innovation success for any city. And I thought you might enjoy that the Seattle Times the other day reported that 2,000 people per year move from King County to Spokane. That's more people than move from King County to Portland or to Phoenix. So people are being drawn across the state. One of my favorite quotes when I was doing some research on you was a woman who said that in Spokane, she and her husband, who's a teacher, we're in the position to have what every young family wants, a good quality of life and affordable housing, which is really hard for a lot of cities to achieve these days. So if you're thinking about reimagining, um, this is a great thing. This, you are ranked among the coolest cities in the country. You're in the hip city cluster, you can see, with a bunch of other cities. It's based on factors like number of vegan stores, microbreweries, and tattoo parlors. It's <laughs> the best of both worlds hip and more affordable than most places in the country, especially bigger cities. So uh, get used to it. Spokane is now a vegan, beer-swilling, tattooed paradise. <laughs> yes, this is you. You really don't have to work that hard uh, to reimagine downtown Spokane because you have always been cool. Your Bon Marche dining room that's pictured in this, it was so gloriously over the top as a design, I really expected to see George Jetson sitting there at the counter. And also on this, I, I hope you can see it, is a label from a suit that says Bon Marche Spokane. So you have always been cool. However, it wasn't that long ago that 
Um, downtowns all over the country, like Spokane's, were being written off as dead. And um, these are from Buffalo. These are not from you. Um, first, there were shopping malls. Then there was big box competition. Um, by the 1980s, downtown seemed like some romantic ideal from the past that was gone never to come again. Um, our downtowns have devolved, they did devolve in the 80s and 90s to this store that you see in the picture, um, One Man's Junk. That business owner has given up before they have even started. One man's junk will always be junk, even if it's another man's junk, and that's not the kind of store that you want in your downtown. However, downtowns really are important, and for a number of reasons. One, not only as a tax base for the community, but it, they're a reflection of our community. I had a developer tell me once that the first thing he always looked at when he was thinking of a community for development, he would drive through downtown. And he said if the downtown was crummy and vacant and abandoned looking, he knew that the public sector and the private sector were not going to be talking to each other in that city, and he just kept on driving. So it really is your downtown is a symbol of what your community is about. In spite of these kind of tough economic times we had a couple decades ago, many communities refused to give up, like you. And ironically, one of the most important things for revitalizing downtowns came from shopping centers. The concept was to compete with shopping malls, let's borrow their best management tool, and that was the common area maintenance charge. When you're in a shopping center, every store that pays rent, you pay a fee on top of that for maintenance and cleaning and security. And city said, well, I wonder if we could do that kind of thing in downtown. And actually, the first place that did it was in Toronto, West Bloor Village, which is pictured here. They figured out how to do an assessment fee on all of the businesses and buildings in their district so that they could have safe, reliable, long-term funding. And the first city in the US that did it, interestingly enough, was New Orleans, who's passed up there. This happened in 1970, and it was a business improvement area, which you have here. And it just gave downtowns a tool to be able to be managed professionally, to be able to compete on the level that shopping malls were doing. BIAs gave us the ability to protect our investments, to make new investments, and to, most importantly, meet our customers' expectations. There are now a couple thousand business improvement areas all over North America, in Japan, um, in Germany, and in Sweden, um, and uh, some coming in Africa. And they have really changed the ability for us to revitalize our communities. It's important because downtown, as I said, is not just a source of tax revenue. It's a mirror of our community's history and values. But, OK, so economic forces are always changing. Um, and downtown needs to continue to evolve. From looking at national trends and seeing what downtowns are doing around the country, I think there are four things that downtowns need to focus on to go forward to stay competitive. There, you yeah, gotta be clean, safe, and attractive because you're competing with um, suburban shopping centers um, and other opportunities for retail. You have to have convenient transportation choices. You have to get people to live downtown so it's a real neighborhood, and you have to have leadership and partnerships. So let's imagine what a successful future looks like you, for you, you vegan, beer-swilling, tattooed Spokanians. All right, it has to absolutely start with clean, safe, and attractive public spaces. Downtowns are literally everybody's neighborhood. Everybody has to feel comfortable in your downtown. And customers these days have choices. It takes a lot these days to get people to get out of their pajamas and come downtown and do shopping, and your retailers need that foot traffic to survive. At Nordstrom this holiday, 30% of their sales were online, but even Nordstrom still needs people to come into their stores. When the business improvement area got renewed in Seattle, we found that the clean program had to have a lot more investment. Seattle has gotten very successful. We have a lot more people working downtown, a lot more residents, a lot more tourists who litter like fiends. And we had to increase our cleaning in our business improvement area quite a bit. And that last year, there are 65 clean ambassadors in Seattle now. They took off 45 thousand graffiti tags and 970,000 gallons of trash. That's what it takes to keep our downtown clean and even it's not clean enough yet. And as you get more successful, you may see this is going to have to be an increasing priority for you. Fortunately for you, in, down, in clean, safe, and attractive, you are way ahead of most cities, including Seattle. Your riverfront park 
pictured here. That kind of amenity we in Seattle have been trying to do since 2001 to get our waterfront park going, and you have been investing in it in the last decade, and it is spectacular. This is one of your best things about downtown, and nowhere else has something like this, and it's a wonderful amenity. So you are really ahead of us. If we can make our downtown so clean and attractive that people want to be there, it makes an environment where a good retailer is going to be able to survive. Help. <laughs> there we go. Um, also, to make a good pedestrian experience for all of our retailers, you have to activate the dead spots. You know what they are, those corners, those scary spots, the ugly blank walls. On the left is a picture of some brave mu musicians that we put on one of our worst corners in Seattle. Um, it just took a little paint and some street furniture to try to make it more comfortable for everyone. And then you can see a picture of a person taking her picture in front of that mural. It's from a website called The Most Instagrammable Walls in Seattle. Instagrammable locations are a thing, and we're happy to help those selfie takers um, get their pictures posted up on Instagram. A mural program is not that expensive. You have some great murals already here, um, and it's really relatively quick to do more. I was in Sacramento, and they have this great program called Wide Open Walls. They're becoming known for their murals, and you'll see them popping up on Instagram with all those selfie pic people taking their pictures. Keeping good street level retail is a top priority for a successful downtown. Um, retail is the sizzle on the steak, or you vegans, the hummus on the carrot, whatever you're going to have. But it, it's really important to make downtown appetizing and, tra and attractive. But retail is absolutely a tough road these days. So in 1979, uh, George Romero made the, mu the movie Dawn of the Dead. It was actually filmed in a shopping mall outside of Monroeville, Pennsylvania, which is now dead and closed. But I think it was a pretty accurate prediction of what was going to happen to shopping malls. It's likely that 20 to 25 percent of all suburban malls in the United States are going to be gone in the next five years. The competition is so tough. So retail mall operators are trying all kinds of things in the suburbs. And we're seeing this in California. They're turning the big empty department stores into virtual reality places for people. And you can see them on the uh, picture up there. I'm not really sure if this is going to be successful. To me, the people with the virtual reality headsets are not that different than the Dawn of the Dead people that are in the other picture. But um, you can see the struggles that they're having going forward. The retail store decline has been compounded also by millennials' buying habits. Millennials tend to like experiences and restaurants and are not, at the moment, big users of coming into stores and buying things. Even in Manhattan now, about 20% of the street level retail is vacant. Walmart has at least one store within 10 miles of 90% of Americans. And in last year, 95% of all Americans shopped at a Walmart. You can tell how the, tough the competition is. Still, Amazon is a force, um, even though um, only 10% of all shopping now is online. Amazon has about 50% of all that online shopping in the US. And in 19, uh, 2017, they shipped about $5 billion worth of items on Amazon Prime alone. So it's an incredible force. By the way, that 10% number hasn't budged in a number of years. It's, people are trying to figure out, is that going to change? Where is it going to go? But it's something to keep in mind. However. No matter what is happening on Amazon, there are still opportunities for good creative retailers in our downtowns. Now, some retailers do okay no matter what. This is a retailer in Seattle. It's uh, Little Darlings uh, Strip Club and Fantasy Unlimited. It, it is right across the street from Amazon headquarters. So if I pulled that picture out a little bit, you'd see two 40-story towers right on either side. And they're advertising Amazon employees get 20% 20 off. They are doing very well, <laughs> apparently. So there are opportunities in retail if you kind of know what your market is. 
Um, by the way, um, in Seattle, because of Amazon, SKUs vary mail. Um, apartment owners, it's like 55, 45, 55% male, 45% female. So, you know, in downtown, there's a lot of lonely, well off, geeky men, so it probably explains this. <laughs> So let's talk about transportation. Transportation is not about getting rid of cars and parking. It's about providing convenient choices to serve your customers. In Seattle, our commute programs were celebrated for reducing carbon emissions. Um, that's good, but that is not why we did them, it, the, that why we supported all those bus and bike options we have. It was totally economic. It's because our property owners came to us and said, our tenants are demanding more bike parking in the building and better transit. And the businesses and tenants in downtown came to us and said, we're trying to hire millennials and creatives and they all want bike parking and they all want bus and transit options and they're not big drivers. So what drove us as an association in Seattle to really push transit and bikes was economic competitiveness and staying competitive. You're growing, your congestion will get worse, and at some point become a competitive advantage, disadvantage. So you're always gonna have people driving downtown, but to keep it easy and convenient, and grow jobs, and grow your residents, not all of those new residents employees can drive their cars. There's just not enough lanes in downtown to make that possible. So, and you also don't wanna turn all of your land into parking lots. You would much rather have retail and residential and office. So you've gotta figure out a way to get choices so people will choose not to get in their car. We added 45,000 jobs in Seattle since 2010 and only 2,200 of them are driving their car because we made the other options so convenient for them. I'd encourage you to try things. It really is just paint to put bike lanes in. You can always paint them out if they don't work. So as I said, it is not about forcing people out of their cars, it's providing a choice. You wanna make it so that driving isn't the only option for someone who wants to come downtown. Our mantra was to focus on customer behavior and do everything we could to make it so convenient people would voluntarily choose any option besides driving. So here's a couple of examples. You know, you have bus passes. Those are really key. People don't have to dig in their purse or in their wallet for cash to get on the bus. Um, we try to get bus passes in the hand of every employee downtown, so it's just really easy to pop on the bus, click, and you're gone. We found some research that showed that people hated waiting at the bus stop, never knowing did the bus just go by, is it ever gonna come, what's going on? So we encouraged in the lower left of the photo to our bus company to put digital signs at all the bus stops in downtown that told people when their bus was coming. On the, let's see, it's the side, let's see, right or left, where you can see there's an app, one bus away. I sit in my office in downtown, I pull that up on my phone, I click on my stop and it tells me how long it's gonna be for my bus to come. And I know exactly how long it takes for the two stoplights I gotta hit, that I know when to get to my bus stop. It eliminates the uncertainty of being at the bus. This One Bus Away app, which was done by a digital genius UW student who was recruited to Google later, um, has been a real game changer for downtown in terms of making it more convenient for people to get the bus. Um, you have a new parking study, you just talked about it. It has strategies to make your existing parking spaces work harder. If you increase the, ex the uses of your existing spaces, it could reduce the pressure to build some new ones. Um, using your parking efficiently, there's a lot you can do on apps. There's an app, I see them in a lot of cities now, where every part you can put every parking garage on that app so people can know where they can go. One of the important ones is, I heard a lot of resistance to parking garages because people were afraid they'd be gouged on the way out and they didn't know how much it was gonna cost, so if you can get some agreement on fares because you're gonna market them, that really helps. For us, Getting people to change the way, their habits in transportation was about making it easy for the customers to do so. <coughs> downtown living. Um, these are a couple of great projects that you have, and downtown residents have transformed downtowns all over the country. Not only do residents reduce commute congestion because they're walking to work, they support your retailers, which is great, but they're also a strong and effective political advocate for the new downtown neighborhood. There is nothing like 
for an organization to have voters come to council meetings to talk about what they want in their neighborhood, a very powerful thing. I thought what was interesting on the RIDPATH site, I saw the little boxes on the side. Those are walk scores, transit scores, and bike scores. So apparently a lot of your new residents coming to downtown are looking for these options because that was one of the sales points on the website. I've worked with probably 60 or 70 downtowns around the country, and people always ask me, what are the secrets to success? And it absolutely is not how big your budget is or how good your economy. It is, I have seen successful revitalization projects without either of those. It's all about leadership. This is pictures of little Arcadia, Florida, which I worked at as a Main Street town. It's in central Florida. Their economy is watermelons. Not much going on there. And the postcard says, Arcadia, a trip back in time. And when we got to Arcadia in the middle of the 90s, it was indeed a trip back in town and not in a good way. A lot of downtown buildings were vacant. And when we toured them, there were these little mounds of sawdust on the floor. I said, you know, what's going on here? And they oh, it's just termites. It's like, OK, that sounds good. Um, they had hardly any money in that program. And no economic prospects that any of us could see. But they had a strong and committed group of volunteers who said, we're not letting this downtown go. They decided they were going to try to make downtown look better by painting the fronts of the buildings cheerful colors. So they got donations of paint from the hardware store at the end of downtown. And the volunteers all bought ladders and brushes. With a fresh coat of paint, and that building really is that pink, the beautiful historic character of the downtown was revealed. And people started to think of that downtown a little differently and with pride. They decided to do historic tours because they had beautiful historic buildings, but they had no money for a brochure. So they made one-page Xeroxes of the history of each building. They put a number on it. They put one in each window of the buildings and did, did, did a map with numbers on it. And that's how they started their downtown historic tours. Now they get bus tours from Sarasota. It's a thriving downtown with restaurants and businesses. And they just started with nothing except a belief. It is all about leadership for downtown stuff. So for every downtown, committed leadership makes a difference. But it's also those four points I talked about. Are you clean, safe, and attractive? Do you have convenient transportation choices? Um, are you recruiting residents to live downtown? And um, do you have great partnerships and leaders? I have chosen a couple best practice examples from around the country, and actually one from Canada, um, of what other downtowns are doing, just to give you an idea of the broad range of things that are happening, and maybe spark some thinking for you as you go into your strategic planning process. OK, devil. There we go. This is an alley project in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, a design firm partnered with the city and the downtown organization to take this alley. There's the before and after up there for you. And it has been really successful. Um, they got the city to change all their policies, to use a simple toolkit and a more streamlined process so it was easier to do other alleys. Pedestrian use of the space increased by 143%, and most importantly, um, by women. Um, because it was perceived as an unsafe alley before. There was no reduction in service vehicles to tenants. The tenants on the street are now partnering to keep up the alley, to keep it clean and bright. And the main use of the space, photography, Instagrammable walls. So they have people from all over taking pictures of themselves all the time in that alley. Here's one from Sacramento. Um, the first year, you know, for a retail business, the first year is always the hardest. Many startups struggle with capital, overhead expenses, permitting processes, and the details of actually managing a business. The Calling All Dreamers program are, is a retail business competition, encourages entrepreneurs to compete for the chance to open a downtown storefront and earn a business startup package, including about $10,000 in matching funds, um, all kinds of technical assistance, financial planning, store design, marketing, graphic design, help with permitting, legal issues, and more. Seven years and seven successful new businesses in downtown Sacramento from this program, uh, ranging from a children's clothing store to a candy store to a spice shop. 
Here's a project in Norfolk, Virginia. It's called the Selden Market. It was a big, vacant um, blight in the middle of downtown. And it opened in 2017 and serves downtown Norfolk's first retail incubator for new and emerging businesses. The market launched with 12 retail tenants and 20 pop-up businesses. In 2018, the market hosted 35 events for visitors and consumers and had 64 pop-ups use the market as a platform to start their new business. The goal of the market actually is to stimulate street level activity and grow new businesses for downtown and the city. Um, there's also a community kitchen. This was really important because they had a lot of people who wanted to start restaurants and food carts and a place where you can come together, try out your menu, try out your stuff, do as a pop-up here, and then maybe grow out into a restaurant before. They um, really have made this a success and it, a big vacant building now is a center for activities, for all kinds of activities all year for, and for families and residents. This is from Topeka. Um, Topeka's about 126,000, it's not that big a city. But they established a committee in 2016 because they had this big dead road right through the center to raise dollars to do, the city was doing infrastructure and they said let's do some streetscape while the city's got, well, got the pipes all torn up. So they started this campaign called Imagine Downtown and they had a goal of $1.8 million. They actually raised 4.2 from private sector businesses and individuals and the projects that they did included a new three-lane st street replaced the previous five-lane road, mid-block cr mid crosswalks, all new lighting, wider sidewalks, eight pocket parks with seating areas and gathering places, and they did this kind of cool artwork with sculptures of famous people from Topeka that's become a real tourist attraction. So this capital investment had incredible spin-off in the community. They got a new hotel along the street, new loft developments, new restaurants, new retail space, and a sense of increased pride in the community. The main block of the street went from a $4 million in tax revenue to $32 million in tax revenue, all due to this project led by the Downtown Topeka organization. This is Brew You in Fresno. I got this specially for you because you have a lot of great brew pubs. The Downtown Fresno organization held a brainstorming session in summer of 2016 to discuss continued advancement of their kind of beer culture in downtown. They called it the Year of Beer. The chosen concept was to do a training program um, to help support their blossoming brewery scene by incubating new businesses and ideas and equipping home brewers with the ability to maybe grow into a street level business. They parker, partnered with their local university, Fresno State, to provide the location and the educational framework and they worked with one of their downtown brew pubs to be the site for the training on the how to's. So in two years time, downtown Fresno's beer scene has tripled from two breweries to six due to this brew you program. This one in San Antonio, done by Centro, which is the downtown organization, was a collaboration between San Antonio's business improvement area, their police department, and Haven for Hope, which is a, a big um, homeless provider, service provider, in just adjacent to downtown San Antonio. Um, they worked on a couple projects. One was called the Gateway Project, where they cleaned up a horrible situation they had under their freeways with homeless encampments. And they did um, street level outreach to people. They trained their business improvement uh, ambassadors and Haven for Hope put social workers on the street to talk to folks. Um, the police department said that there's been a 70% reduction in homelessness in the areas that they've cleaned up. They were able to keep them and hold them. They made uh, 1,900 engagements with people on the street and moved 79 people into programs and housing. They also uh, had two Haven for Hope outreach specialists dedicated to downtown, and the downtown ambassador program started hiring people coming out of Haven for Hope, and so far they've hired over 100 people to come and work. So it's been a great program that has made a big difference in San Antonio. This one is in Seattle, Pioneer Square. And on the upper left, you can see that's a before for Occidental Park, which was vacant and a locus for crime in Pioneer Square. So Pioneer Square and the Downtown Seattle Alliance 
convinced the city parks department to let us manage the park. And so the two organizations have been activating the heck out of that park for the last couple years. And it takes a good commitment of time and money. But now this park is a destination for families and attracts women. And those two things are the gold standard for any park. Um, and the buildings around the park have started to redevelop. We had to overcome a lot of objections from people, particularly in the homeless community, because they said, you're just gonna push homeless people out. But we were committed that parks are for everyone. And recently, after the changes, our homeless newspaper, which had been very negative, actually celebrated the work because there are still homeless people in that park. It's just there are so many people now, everybody fits in. But I wanted to point out to you, the events that they're doing don't have to be expensive. These are two of the most popular events of the last two years. One is watching ice melt. The other one was knitting sw little sweaters for the trees. So you never know. <laughs> this one, uh, this I grew up near Albany, New York. Um, and. Albany, like a lot of upstate New York, has been economically depressed since about 1900. Not depressed for a couple decades, depressed for more than a century. And uh, so in 2015, more than three dozen stakeholders, including the Albany Downtown Association and the BID, nonprofit entities, academic institutions, came together to form Capitalize Albany to champion the revitalization of downtown Albany. What was different about this plan is they did a business plan and a playbook. We've all seen a lot of plans and says it'd be a good thing to create more jobs. This plan was very detailed on the how and the who and the what and how much. And in the time since 19, 2015, they've had $130 million worth of new investment, $180, under construct, $180 million under construction, 300 new residential units, and for the first time in a lot of people's memory, the vacancy rate for office is down below 20%. So um, it's about the details in the strategy and the commitment to implementation that makes the difference. So before I end, I want to talk a little bit about Seattle. Um, just a little bit. This is a map of all the development projects that are happening in downtown Seattle. The, each one of these dots is a development project. Blue are completed, the orange and green are under construction, the rest have permit issues but not started yet. We wanted this kind of growth in downtown. And you know, I grew up in Albany. Um, I know what a depressed and hopeless community is like and I will take growth any day. But um, in Seattle, it has had some consequences for sure. This shows 227 projects working their way through the pipeline, with 66 currently under construction. Most of them are actually residential. We're having a lot of new residential built in downtown. Um, we suffered a lot during the 2008 recession. We lost 20,000 jobs then, so we had a real push to get more jobs in downtown, and now I think Amazon has about 45,000 employees in downtown alone. This is what downtown's gonna look like if all that gets built. And this is gonna be a very different place from around now, as you can see from the rendering. And there are a lot of benefits to this growth and prosperity. However, this much change this fast has been tough. Housing costs, traffic, construction, it's all really challenging. And this was our Christmas present from the New York Times. Um, I mean, really? Uh, we used to be proud that we weren't San Francisco with its income equality, inequality, and unaffordable housing. Um, now we have what they called Seattleization, which apparently is a real thing, and according to the Times is a particularly dire diagnosis and characterized by high housing costs, tech wealth, and a combination that has thoroughly transformed our city in a small, in a short period of time. You know, in so many ways, Seattle is an amazing uh, story. When I got there in 1994, Frederick Nelson was vacant, I Magnum was vacant, Norsum was going to leave. Um, and you know, we're now getting pe thousands of people from around the country. And when you think of great American cities that have fallen on hard times, Seattle in a lot of ways seems enviable. A lot of our growth, of course, is due to Amazon. But you know, Amazon's start was not all that auspicious. This is the very first thing that Amazon sold online when they were almost uh, exclusively a bookstore. It's the 
fluid concepts and creative analogies, computer models of the fundamental mechanisms of thought. I mean, a total nerdomania. You could not have predicted from the sale of this book what was going to happen with Amazon. You know, people say to me all the time, oh, Kate, it was so lucky that Amazon uh, grew in Seattle. And it was like, that just totally annoys me because that was not luck. That was 60 years of hard work by the city and the downtown association to make that downtown the kind of place that Amazon would run and expand in when they had the opportunity to do so. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos directed his team to expand in downtown because he believed that downtown's urban vital scene was going to enable him to attract the best employees. Um, that was why he expanded there, because he thought he was going to be more competitive in getting the really smart, creative folks. I believe very seriously that luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And every city has opportunity, but not every city is ready to capitalize on it. The next Amazon or Starbucks or Nordstrom could be in downtown Spokane right now. So how can you make downtown Spokane, the place that the next Amazon is going to choose to decide to stay and expand. The search for Amazon HQ2 was really interesting. Um, when Amazon started in Seattle, it was an affordable city with a lot of tech talent due to Microsoft and due to Boeing. The future now is for cities with a highly educated workforce and a good quality of life. That is cities like Spokane. So it's time to step up your game. You are already a regional powerhouse with a rich history. It's a beautiful setting, and downtown's an important source of tax revenue for the future of city priorities. Downtown Spokane is really worth investing in. And remember, the next Amazon could be here right now. When they start to grow, will downtown Spokane be the place that they choose to stay? Let this sign by the Sacramento artist and muralist Alex Trujillo guide your efforts. Every day is your chance to make this city a little better. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, please, another, uh, just another warm thank you for Kate. Thank you. Kate is kind enough to stick around for a little bit before she has to catch her plane, so I'd encourage you to stick around as well and pick her brain. Uh, she's got a wealth of knowledge she couldn't possibly pack into a 30-minute presentation. Um, so I've just got a couple housekeeping things, and then we'll uh, invite you to uh, join us next door for a little libation. So first of all, um, uh, we also recognize, saw some, some thoughts and some ideas churning and some, in the non, in verbal conversations going on. Um, you know, Sp Spokane has a lot of, some of the things that Kate has talked about already happening and some of you are already doing that. So don't take that as a, as a misnomer or a slight. Uh, I think that's a great sign. Uh, our, my hope and goal today is that Kate inspired you to think about what's next. Um, I also want to put a little editorial is that uh, we are incredibly fortunate uh, for our friends at River Park Square and our leaders that have uh, have uh, the ownership, uh, Betsy and your and St Stacy and your team, we are fortunate that the downtown mall is defying all of the odds in our country. But that's again not by accident. It's because they have a phenomenal team working every day to create that experience that is defying those odds. It's creating that place for all of us to be. But that relies on each and every one of us. What is the decision we're making every morning when we get up? Are we going to shop online or are we going to shop downtown? Are we going to eat at, you know, outside of downtown or are we going to eat at the restaurants in the mall? So I just encourage you to remember that it's really up to us about the strength and the, and the uh, longevity of our mall. Uh, next, I want to thank my team. Um, uh, so starting with Liz, who really orchestrated and, and masterminded this entire program today, and then all of my team that is here today, would you be kind enough to stand or wave so that we could recognize you? Please stand up. Stand up. Come on. Thank you. We have a small team, but an incredibly mighty and dedicated team, and many of the faces you probably see out on the street each day, please take the time uh, when you see them on the street to thank them uh, for the work that they do. So uh, we also have a fun little giveaway. So we partnered up with our downtown partner in, 
in Penticton, and we, um, a couple of you actually donated to contribute to a little giveaway they had at their annual meeting this winter, and we're about to give away a little getaway for Penticton. So Maria, if you could, I actually would like to maybe have you stop at Kate. Kate, I'd like you to draw the winning card. Uh, for those of you that uh, saw the basket out there and put a card in, uh, this is for that giveaway. I mean, if you'd bring it forward to me, thank you. Jason Dolloff with uh, g and All right. So Jason, just hang, hang tight. I'll actually have you connect with Michelle afterwards and we'll get your contact information. Um, so thank you very much and congratulations. I want to thank our sponsors, first starting with STCU and all the sponsors that we already mentioned. I want to thank Progeny Arrow for uh, the decorations that are about the room. I also want to thank our friends at Spokane Talks that are, that are taping this uh, show that will be rebroadcast uh, at a later time. And then uh, finally, I want to thank you. You know, we talked a lot about our sponsors. We talked about how important they are and how we couldn't do this without them. Uh, frankly, we could have all the sponsors in the world. If you weren't here today, this show wouldn't be anything. So I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. So I want to invite you to join us behind, uh, behind you uh, for a little libation. We have a little live music from the Lane King Jazz Combo out of Whitworth. And I want to challenge you with thinking about, I want to take uh, Dawn's, I think, incredibly insightful words uh, to, to mull over amidst a cocktail and some hors d'oeuvres. What is the next incomprehensible thing that we should be shooting for in downtown Spokane? Thank you very much. Have a gorgeous day.